I think I was just going to start by telling you that I've been promoted since the blurb was, was written. And I'm only telling you that because it's something that I'll come to at the end. So my, my title is Professor of Utopian Studies. And I'm not telling you that because I, I'm so clever and I want you to know that I'm a professor. But, but I'll come back to the owning the label issue of utopian studies towards the end of the session. I'll just try and work out where to stand so they're not in your way. Um, I've, on the tables there are handouts to accompany my talk because I'm going to be using people's words a lot. I'm talking across lots of different intentional communities. I've visited about somewhere between 40 and 50 over the years in my research and I'm making general points and I'm, I'm always worried methodologically when I, when I do that sort of thing because you know, how do you know that what I'm saying is valid and how can I make it interesting for you and bring it to life? So, so I'm trying to use the words of the people who I'm talking about as much as possible. That's why there's rather a long handout. There's some spares here if there aren't enough on the tables. Um, I've now given away my copy. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's just put this into... Um, slideshow. We've got, we've got none on our table. Is there any? Yeah. yeah, there's some at the front here. We can. That's okay, no problem. <laughs> no problem. So I'm talking about intentional communities as practical utopias. That's, that's what I'm about today. And I'm going to start with quite a long extract from one person's um, interview. And this was somebody who lives in a Quaker community in New Zealand, founded by elder people for other elder people. Um, so it's a sort of Quelker elder <coughs> community. And this is this person's response to the question, why did you join this community? And the whole extract is on the, on the handouts. I'm not going to talk through the whole thing, but I do just want to show you his response. I think I like standing here. This is good. Um, so he says he, he thinks he's here for several reasons. There's a long pause. I don't know if you've ever been to a Quaker meeting, but there's long pauses, I think, for a long time. And this was a group interview. So Michael, the, the person who's speaking here, this is Michael, thought for a long time. And he said, OK, I think I'm here for several reasons. And then he produced this wonderfully stru structured discussion of the utopianism of, of his, his reasons for being here. And he starts by talking about the, the joy or the desire to live with other Quakers, other people who are part of the Society of Friends, who share a way of looking at the world. That's, that's his first point. Then he talks about his frustrations that he's experiencing before he founded this community. Oh, he didn't found it, before he joined this community. It had been running for a few years before he joined. He's an architect, and he talks about his frustrations of building nice houses for nice people, but not really making any difference in the world. And in fact, you know, his, his creations perhaps even contributing to what was wrong. So, and he had this idea, this vision of living together on a commonly held piece of land. So that's all part of his second reason. There's something wrong with his, with his life at the moment, and a vision of some other better way of doing things. And here he's talking about the experience of visiting and living in this community and saying it's quite challenging, sometimes it's quite discouraging. <coughs> but he and his wife agree that it's been worth the, worth the perseverance and that together they've become more than the sum of the parts. And he talks about the huge rewards of being part of this community. And then his final point is that it's wonderful to realise his vision that it's possible, in this case, his vision is to own land or to, to live on land without owning it privately, not to commodify land as into a form of property. And he says several times in his answer to my question, you know, this is my, my utopia, this is my vision. And the reason I wanted to, to share that quite long extract from an interview with you is that Michael, in, this, in his answer to my question, why did you join this community? He raises lots of the things that I want to say today. We could just leave now, really, because he's, 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 he's said it. Um, he talks about intentional communities as, as a critical response to life in the mainstream, life outside. He talks about the, the challenges and the rewards 
of living a dream with a collection of like-minded people. He talks about the inspiration that comes from realising that you can do it. Even though it's imperfect, you can, you can do it. And I think that framing intentional communities as utopian helps us to understand something about them, something important, I think. Helps us to understand something about why they're founded, why people join them, why people leave them, why they sometimes fold. I'm not going to have time to talk about all of those things today, but I will touch on them as best I can. As I understand them, I think everybody here knows what an intentional community is, but I'll just tell you how I use the term so that we're all clear where I'm coming from. Um, intentional communities are groups of people who live together and sometimes work together for some commonly agreed purpose. Um, and those, the, the commonly agreed purpose goes beyond family or traditional ties. So it involves intention and community. There's a shared intention and a desire to live in community. And as we heard, these come in many forms. Here are some, some pictures of different sorts of intentional communities that I've, I've visited in my time. And they can be defined according to the sort of space they occupy. Are they urban? Are they rural? To their ideology or their reason for being. Some are religious, some are secular. Um, there are many, many different sorts of intentional communities. You will always encounter group meals. That's probably the commonality in intentional communities. You always find people eating together, and quite often that's what holds a community together through the difficult times. So intentional community, I think, is probably clear. Utopia, I guess it's a word that everybody knows and has an understanding of, but uh, the thing that I'd want you to really kind of grasp about utopia and why I think it's useful to use this label to hang on to intentional communities is this paradox that lies at the heart of the concept or the word utopia. It's a pun. The word was created by Thomas More in 1516 when he published his book Utopia. And he was punning on three Greek words. We have EU, we have OU, and we have topos. These two sound the same when you say them out loud, so it's a phonetic pun. You roll them together when you say utopia. And EU means good, OU means no, not, or non, and topos means place. So we've got the utopia is the good place that's no place. And that, that poses a, a tension of realisability. If you're trying to make it happen, if you're trying to sort of reach a utopia, you will never get there, because utopia is always over the horizon. It's always around the corner, a little bit out of reach, not <coughs> quite there. Something perhaps you move towards, but you never arrive at. And that's one of the things that makes utopia and utopianism so interesting and exciting, I think. Um, and so, so difficult and challenging when you try to sort of make it happen. I think the thing to do is to accept that you will never get there, but nonetheless to keep trying. That would be my, my, my take on that one. So from the word utopia, we get the words utopianism and utopian. And um, all utopians start their thinking from a critical perspective. All utopians believe that there's something wrong with their society, something wrong with the world around them, something wrong with their presence. Now, what that thing is will vary from person to person, group to group. So for Thomas More, it was private property for example. Um, but different utopian writers and different utopian acti activists and practitioners will have different ideas of what is wrong, but they will nonetheless have thought carefully, forensically, about their society and thought, it's this. This is the thing that's wrong. Or this is the cluster of things that are wrong. They then imagine how the world or their society would be if those things were radically transformed. So how would it be, for example, if we didn't have private property? That's that, and that's an exercise in utopian thinking. And so utopias are always a mixture, a dual impulse. This is happening both at the same time of criticism and creativity. There's something wrong. How can we change it? <coughs> There's always some radical thinking involved inside utopianism. And this, I think, just fits really, really well with what happens inside intentional communities. <coughs> You can find critical discussions 
of what's wrong with society inside mission statements like this one from the UK Co-Housing Network. Here, the thing that's being identified as wrong um, is to do with urban decay, is to do with the alienation that we experience by living in conventional streets, and nuclear houses, nuclear families, the fear, crime, real crime and fear of crime, neglected open spaces, lack of facilities. And this is a statement um, from the website of an actual co-housing community saying, well, we exist because we desire a greater sense of community. And in here, I would identify this as kind of echo of this criticism, although this is an American community and this is the UK co-housing network. But there's, there's always something wrong, and so we're going to try and do it better. That's what I love about what I call utopians, is that they're not just thinking about what's wrong, but they're also trying to make it better. Let's make the world a better place. That's what I love about utopians. And that's that creative and critical impulse I identify inside those extracts. So this is, this is um, quite a long, again, lengthy extract from an interview with a woman inside a women's housing co-op. And this co-op was founded initially as a women's shelter, a refuge, but grew to be a, a, a very positive space. And as the uh, women took over the ownership of the property and made it into, into a co-op. And she's saying, even on the days I hate it, because everybody hates their life in an intentional community sometimes, um, I still live here because it makes sense. And she goes on to talk about the logic of living a life that I think is really normal every day. And so this, this critical creative impulse happens inside the communities as well. So people don't start, stop thinking critically just because they've moved into an intentional community. They're critical of, their, of what they're doing. They're internally self-critical while they're also still looking for something better. And <coughs> this is a sort of articulation of faith that, that she's found something better. And here, towards the end of this extract, she's linking it to a wider vision of society. She, she's thinking about this particular community as a very nurturing space. And she says, what would, it, what would society look like if it nurtured people? How would it be to live in a, in a nurturing society? And I, I think, she says, I can see it starting to unfold here. And that's really exciting. What's going to happen next? So those are some examples of this um, dual impulse of creativity and criticism. And my second point, I'm going to make four if I have time, but my second point, so that was my first, criticism and creativity. My second concerns the trial and error nature of utopia. Academics call this heuristic, the heuristic nature of utopia. It's just about trial and error. Suck it and see. Try it. See what happens. Adjust what you're doing. Move on. Try to, try to learn from your mistakes. And so intentional communities, I think, are people who are trying to live the good life on a daily basis. And here are some, some extracts about how that feels when it goes well. So when it goes well and you, you are living according to your values, according to your beliefs about how you want to live your life, People speak very powerfully and very positively about how it feels having that level of support we've got here. Again, this, this is actually a different women's housing co-op. Feeling respected and involved, feeling understood, knowing that there is support when I need it. And then this extract comes from a different community again. This is a lesbian separatist community founded by a group of people who were friends um, but didn't know each other terribly well, but were all committed to lesbian feminism and separatist feminism. And the opportunity to actually live their dream of a life in a space without men is what she's talking about here, and saying how, how empowering that's been. And it's pushed and, in, and encouraged and allowed this participant to, to really live her ideals and to test them, to try out her ideas which have taken her in lots of different directions, many of which haven't worked. And one of the things that didn't work in this community was the idea of non-possessive loving relationships. It was something they wanted to break free of that they associated with patriarchy. But actually they had catastrophically 
disastrously painful experiences of open relationships. And they just decided, OK, this doesn't work. Um, but nonetheless, we will, we will stay and we'll find another way of being together. So trial and error, learning from experience, trying to live according to your values. And then that can be very painful. So the example I just gave you was a very painful. But here's, here's another one. This is from an anarchist commune in which everything was owned in common. And the person saying, I, I, I often ask people about the best and worst aspects of their life in a community, just to get a sense of the texture of life in that place. And she talks here about the, the pain um, and the sense of betrayal and extra hurt that comes when a person turns your trusting relationships and your shared values against you. And in this instance, it's, and she just talks about it in taking, trying to be taken out for money. So these people were experimenting without money. And she says the worst thing is when people go back to the old ways and try to hold themselves together. Instead of dealing with the conflict, there's always conflict inside communities. Instead of dealing with it, they run away and run back to their old ways of doing things. And there, I have lots of examples in my transcripts of, of people telling me about the pain of people sort of breaking the trust in that way. And communities that survive across time have ways of dealing with conflict. Um, and they're really important. I'm not going to talk in great detail about them, but it's, they usually have a mixture of a core of people who really hang on in there. Really hang on in there. Um, and structures and processes, agreements about communication, about what to do when you're in conflict with somebody, um, entrance and exit rules, which have been agreed by the people who are living there. So those, those are things that enable people to live with conflict. But sometimes, sometimes people leave. And sometimes if a group realises that actually they didn't hold all the same values, they didn't really share the same vision after all, then a group might, might fold. Because people in intentional communities will stand strong in the face of all sorts of pain and conflict and challenge. But once the reason for being there disappears, then it tends to all fall apart. Or it can all fall apart. So to illustrate um, structures and processes <coughs> mirroring values, I'll just take you back to the, to the Quaker community that I started with. And this is um, an extract from this, this community discussion that I had with people. And I asked them, why has the community lasted for so long? And it was 25 years old at the time. And Leia's saying, well, nobody's the boss. That's one thing. Somebody else says, it takes ages to make decisions, but when you've got a decision, you know they're sound. Everyone's behind it. That's another. The third is the role of the clerk. Again, if you know about Quakers, you'll know that the role of the clerk is actually a very powerful role. The clerk is the person who records the decision. And that, that is the decision, whatever's recorded. And of course, that could be abused, but ideally it isn't. Um, and because the clerk is a role of power, you only do it for a week at a time. And because the clerk is a role of power, you also have responsibility for cleaning the toilets in the common house during that week. So it's a kind of, <laughs> let's keep this keep in hand. Yes, yes. Um, everyone can talk in meetings. And, uh, and here, everything's practice and theory. Nothing's just theory. Everything's practice and theory. And then they talk about the social glue, the meal every week that holds people together. And a rotation of puddings, and sometimes it goes wrong and everybody, everybody brings one. <laughs> but these, these are lovely examples of, of Quaker values in practice, daily practice, and deliberately um, subverting something that often can happen in a community, which is um, power sort of gathering around people who are most capable, most articulate, most willing to put the work in, perhaps. So the rotating clerk is an example of trying to subvert that. Right, nearly there. My third point, which is 
my penultimate, and I'll be quite quick on this, is that intentional communities are small microcosms for a better society, for doing things better. They are inspirational spaces. They're inspirational for the people who are outside, people like me who, who visit these places. This is a very carefully designed co-housing community. This one's in New Zealand again. And I can see from this site plan how carefully these people have thought about things like runoff, waste, water. Um, every aspect of their daily lives has been planned into the construction of this small site with 32 homes. And that's what it looks like as a lived space. So they are inspiring for outsiders. They're also inspiring for people who live the life. So I've talked about how challenging it is, how tough it is, but also people almost always in interviews will talk about the affirmative experiences. If you've got a dream, you can, you can, you can do it. You can make it happen here, this person's saying. If you've got a dream for today, just imagine how it'll be in 10 years' time. And there's something about scale. Intentional communities will never change the world all on their own because they're so small and there's so few of them. But there is something about scale and the satisfaction of seeing something happen, seeing and feeling the change that you're involved with. Stretching your thinking to think about common good, not just your own needs. Showing yourself and other people that there are alternatives, there are better ways of doing things. Just the fact that things are possible when you share a dream, when you share the endeavour, when you share the work. So the final point is the bad news. <laughs> <laughs> and this is that utopianism is a, is, a, is a dangerous label to put onto people. And this, this troubles me greatly. Um, utopianism is seen as naive, excessively optimistic, um, perhaps dangerous, perhaps a bit stupid. I remember when Barack Obama was first elected as President of the United States, there was a sudden flood of newspaper title, um, headlines calling him utopian and unrealistic. And but, so, so it is, I, I fear I may do damage to the movement by calling them utopian. I also feel that the interpretive um, value is, is, is worth that risk. And as I said at the beginning, I, I decided to, to own the label myself when I was promoted last year. I was asked whether I wanted to be a professor of politics or a professor of political theory. And I said, utopian studies, please. And there was this long silence. And <laughs> a few, <laughs> few weeks later, someone from the university came back to me and said, well, are you, are you sure? Because surely people won't take you seriously. And I said, well, yes, absolutely, especially now that you've said that. <laughs> I, will, I will have that label. So there is the danger of being accused of, of chasing rainbows with, with utopianism. But I think that the, the value that comes from this interpretive framework makes it worth the risk. Thank you. That's me.